quick note that we recorded the next few episodes before the pandemic, so we're just continuing with our regular release schedule, but I'll add that I'm sending good wishes to you and your businesses. This episode is sponsored by Sapphire Partners. Sapphire is the top recruiting firm in Southern California. If you don't already know Sapphire Partners, then I'm happy to make the introduction. In addition to recruiting compensation back channel intelligence, they're also very active investors, having invested in over 70 of their clients. Thank you, Sapphire Partners. Hello, and welcome to the LA Venture Podcast. We're David Waxman and Minnie Ingersoll, partners and investors at 10110. Today, we are here with Dinesh Morjani, managing partner at Comcast Ventures. Hi, nice to be with you. Thanks for being here. Comcast Ventures, I believe you guys are writing checks, I think you said between like three and 20 million? Yeah, we do uh, seed checks all the way to growth checks. I think our sweet spot is really focused on product market fit, which often is described as a Series A check, but we'll invest before and after that as well. Great, great. So we're definitely going to ask you a lot of questions about Comcast Ventures. Uh, We're here in your Santa Monica office, so we're going to learn a lot more about what you're doing here. But I want to start, actually, you have a super interesting background. So you um, did many things, but you also are known for being the founder and running Hatch Labs, which hatched Tinder. So Super interesting to know more about what you were doing at Hatch and some of the stories from from that time. Sure. To maybe understand Hatch, it it would be helpful to understand the origin story. I was uh, running mobile at IAC with my team and had uh, told Barry Diller and the team that I had planned to resign to go focus on building a lab to incubate my own ventures. We were essentially running mobile for a number of companies inside um, IAC, which operated as independent P&Ls focused on on mobility, but I felt like there was an opportunity, this is back in 2010, to build our own companies. And I had built companies before and was missing the entrepreneurial endeavor to do that. So uh, we were in Barry's office on his couch, and I told him that I was going to start a lab. And and he said, well, would you want to do it here? And I said, it's probably not a good idea. We don't have the incentive model governance, and having a large public company build these things uh, might be a, a treacherous recipe. And he uh, he said, well, give it some thought. And the next day, he put me on the spot in, a, in our quarterly CEO meeting alongside Jack Walsh, who was an advisor to Barry at the time in our quarterly meetings. Uh, and Jack asked me if I was going to do it. And I said, well, I'm giving it some thought. And he pressed me to consider it. And so after five months of negotiating the terms, we formed a new company. It was a Delaware C-Corp called Hatch Labs. And uh, IAC was an investor, and I had, uh, had a requirement for an outside investor, which was Extreme Labs. Uh, so we brought in two investors into the company, and we were our own company to build our own new technology startups in the mobile space. So we went off starting from October. We started building companies from October 21st, 2010, over the next couple of years. And uh, one of those companies we built in the early part of 2012 was Tinder. It was originally called Matchbox. So we we were fortunate uh, to get intro to Sean. And... Um, at the time, we were looking to hire my second employee in the West Coast office. The first, his first uh, employee was a senior engineer named Joe Munoz, who was very talented. And uh, I got to know Sean over a period of time in uh, really January 2012. And at the time, we were focused on building something in local merchant loyalty. Think of a modern day belly or level up or ritual uh, focused on rewarding behavior around local merchants uh, in your area that patrons would go visit. But at the time, Sean uh, was deciding what he wanted to work on, and he liked the idea of doing something around local merchant loyalty. So we hired him specifically for that venture. And to answer your earlier question, we specifically have theses and ideas around uh, a particular consumer enterprise software product in the mobile space that we would fund. So we would have our own ideas. Were there other companies, or did Tinder eat the whole thing? I think Tinder ended up absorbing a lot of the resources. In fact, uh, for example, in Los Angeles, um, we had a really talented CTO and uh, early employee at another company, and we put him on the co-founding team of of Tinder as the CTO. Uh, His name's Ryan, um, because Tinder needed more fuel in terms of talent to continue growing. Um, So it did end up uh, absorbing a lot of the resources, at least on the West Coast office. I've been married too long to have used Tinder. It's very hard (laughs) to like check it out if you're married. But I, I remember in really early on, maybe 2012, 2013, being at a party and a guy who was single was using Tinder. And he said, if I had to buy this phone and this Verizon plan that I'm on, and if all of that just did Tinder, no phone, no text, no other apps, I'd do it. I was thinking that's that's product market fit. That's really kind of something. When did you know it was going to be that level of hit? So 
we saw early signs of product market fit just with our own dog fooding when we were playing with the product in the summer and fall of 2012. But just because uh, you're eating your own dog food and you think there's a successful product, it doesn't mean it's going to be promising. So in the fall of 2012, um, after we had had the product in market for a little bit of time, so just to be clear, we launched it in August 2012 into public beta. Um, I had moved to California to oversee the team to launch the product. And one of the things we observed about the metrics, um, this was late September into October, is that we had really high engagement. So we didn't have a large user base. I think it was only a couple thousand users, if I remember the numbers. So the question to ask when we saw that level of engagement was, is that engagement replicable across a larger user base? And we felt that social discovery was a problem that the world was dealing with. It wasn't just uh, limited to this small uh, segment of users that, that we'd introduced the product to. And as a result, if we knew we had this engagement with this segment of, of users, we felt it could scale across a number of users through a high viral coefficient. So at, at that point, we wouldn't say it was successful, but we had enough promising engagement metrics to justify continue investing and building the company. And what do you think drove that engagement? What were some of the key insights? Because there were other dating apps out there. And, you know, was it the swiping or was it? I, I think it was a it was a confluence of things, but I might distill it down to a couple things this product did well. I think swiping certainly enhanced uh, the usage because it was fun. It was a gesture that was really fun and natural. But I'd maybe further refine it to the double blind introduction model as the primary driver behind why Tinder took off. And if you um, move away from the technology and the product and think about human behavior and and uh, the psychology of, of people, if I walk into a restaurant or a bar and I happen to see someone across the way who I find attractive, the idea if I'm single that I have the motivation or comfort in approaching that person that I don't know and striking up a conversation, it clearly demonstrates that a lot of people um, would not do that because they're worried about their own risk, the risk and and uh, and concern over rejection. So if you had that same situation, but a friend whispered into your ear that that person had expressed interest in you, suddenly your confidence level might change and you might feel comfortable walking over to that person. And so that double-blind introduction model was a technology solution or programmatic solution to solving a human psyche or human behavioral challenge. Then the question is, that works, but can that scale the way software can? And in the case of Tinder and that mobile application, the answer was yes. So you had a double-blind introduction model, which I think helped demonstrate product market fit, and then you had the ability to scale that across a large number of people through software and distribution through a mobile app. And that was probably the secret sauce around Tinder. Did you start charging right away? No. How long was it before you started charging? Uh, we waited, I think, at least a couple of years before we started charging. There were some experiments around subscription that were being tested, uh, particularly in other countries. But in the beginning, for a high network effect-driven product, the goal was to help make sure that the problem Tinder was solving was being solved for a large number of people. And um, we weren't putting in paywalls or barriers to, to make that happen. Eventually, it's still a product until it really begins to monetize to become a sustainable, enduring, standalone company. And we introduced that monetization um, in addition to ads eventually, uh, but we wanted to make sure that we were careful about how we introduced it in as well as the price points. Yeah, I'd love to know even a little bit more about how you think about that because we, we have this conversation with founders all the time who don't want to put anything in front of scale but also want to start monetizing. And there's inevitably a discussion about like, when is a little bit of friction okay? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a good question. I think it's a, a trial and experiment, experimentation process. Um, just to be clear, I had uh, left Tinder. I was no longer on the board um, by the time monetization had started, but absolutely was not making operating decisions about rolling out monetization. However, the tea leaves are pretty clear when you think about how to monetize uh, a software product. If I back up and, and share the three ways that companies make money outside of generating money on the float or fiscal or, or monetary policy done by governments, sure. um, it's essentially some form of advertising, which could be lead gen, advertising, brokerage, commission, display ads, whatever it might be. Some form of membership, which is a form of a subscription. You're delivering annuity value for ongoing 
fees and payments, and some form of a transaction, essentially selling a product or service. So there's actually a limited set of choices. Even though we see innovations in business models and go-to-market strategy, you can mix and marry different ways of monetizing among those three buckets and all the subcategories of monetization within those three buckets with a product. And so all three in this case could have been tested out. It could have been a freemium model. It could have been a subscription model or an ad model. And if the advertising wasn't disruptive to the user experience, you could add on advertising. But as we know, an advertising revenue model requires a law of large numbers. Now, luckily, Tinder had that, um, but many businesses don't. And so if you can deliver enough value to charge a subscription fee, it's a much more reliable annuity revenue business. Great. Uh, it's so interesting. But so you left Tinder. You made the choice to to leave Tinder. And do you still think that model is an, is a model that either you would do again um, or you think is a successful model for someone who maybe is schizophrenic and wants to start eight companies at once or a few companies at once? I would have done most of it the same way. There are a few things I might have changed. Um, in fact, when we got funding um, from our investors from Extreme Labs and IAC to build Hatch 2, essentially the second vehicle inside our, our Delaware C um, that would give us a runway to fund and build the next set of ideas that we had uh, into real companies. The proposed changes we would have made to Hatch 1, we tried to implement in, in Hatch 2, which is we wanted to give entrepreneurs more ownership, essentially more egalitarian cap tables. We wanted to make some changes to how we handled some of our operating expenses, et cetera. And, and so I think we recognized what worked really well in Hatch 1, and we would have made those changes in Hatch 2 to, to build the next set of interesting companies that can hopefully have a, a benefit to society but uh, I don't think that model worked with our investors, so uh, we decided not to not to continue doing it. But we're fortunate that the first uh, Hatch Labs worked out really well. So uh, we had uh, we had closed operations for Hatch, and all the resources were focused on on Tinder. Um, I tried to take some time off, and in my effort to take time off, I was involved with another company uh, called Clever Beast um, that I'd co-founded with a number of other folks, and. Uh, became the interim CEO of that company just to get it through its next stage of growth. And we we launched that company. Um, I eventually sold my stake and um, again, tried to take some time off. But by that point in uh, 2013, I was in conversations with Warburg Pincus, uh, got to know a couple of the partners there and was extremely impressed with the organization and, and the private equity firm. So as it turned out, I joined them as an executive in residence and uh, began working with them officially in uh, early 2014. So I don't know uh, that much about Warburg Pincus or really about private equity, but I'm curious. I mean, I imagine they're not doing a lot of mobile app development. Um, so I'm curious, just what were you? What was sort of a typical? What, what were you doing? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> <clears throat> so a couple things. One is um, Warburg Pincus was looking at investing in mobility and innovative mobile companies, and I'd spent a lot of time in that space. Most of my focus was taking companies from zero to one and not from one to 10. So the uh, the stage at which we take a company public and, and continue growing it as a large um, market moving, independent, enduring business. And so Warburg was an opportunity to, to do that. And at the same time, they were pretty progressive in looking for um, innovative mobile companies that they could put their capital and resources behind to build larger businesses and, and uh, create, deliver, and harvest value. So uh, I was fortunate to get to know their team. Um, they were doing a lot of growth equity investing. When we shared some investment theses and began talking, um, it seemed like a natural fit. They didn't have an operating partner role. So instead, at the time, their their best and closest fit was an executive in residence, which is what they offered me. Um, so I sat on boards uh, for Warburg Pincus, co-invested with them, not just uh, sourcing the deal and working with them to close investments, but also co-investing in the deal, which I had done on a couple of companies with them. And it's worked out pretty well. And frankly, I think of the firm as family. It's an incredible, very courageous, very talented, very low-key, and high-integrity firm that operates around the globe. I think they've made um, you know, 800 to 900 investments and deployed well over $80 billion of capital into startups across 40 countries. And it's usually into startups. I sort of think of PE as like, coming in and helping my more old school, um, I don't know, less of like a venture backed business, but my steel industry or something. Am I, do I just have that wrong? You, you know, I, I think uh, if I roll the clock back 10 years, my conventional 
uninformed view of, of private equity was probably similar to yours. Okay, fine. Um, I'm and taking I'm, it behind his and, and I, No, no, and I'm not suggesting you're, you're uninformed at all. I, I Actually, quite, quite the opposite. But I think there's an impression that is created by the media and also what we read about private equity. And I think there's a lot of flavors of it. And I think firms are drastically different, both in terms of their reputation, how they treat their employees, um, how they work with their companies. I found Warburg Pincus to be um, exceptional at uh, being empathetic to founders, recognizing the value of companies that needed capital to grow, but at the same time, were at a unique stage where they could become a, a force in the particular industry they were in. And uh, Warburg was well suited to help shape what those companies look like as they grew. And it's evidenced by the quality of talent at the firm. Uh, if you took a, take a look at the leadership, I think it's quite clear. What's the difference between um, being sort of a growth stage investor and being in private equity? Um, I think there's a heavy overlap. Um, so classic venture capital moves from product market fit uh, to you know capital expansion stage of the company and scaling and then uh, reaching growth equity where uh, a business is typically reach a certain scale and is starting to look at cultivating its options as it becomes a larger business um, to go through a financing event. They can open it up to public market investors, for example, uh, which would be an IPO, um, or maybe set itself up for for a acquisition by another company. Those lines are very blurred when a company is going through those transitions. And a lot of firms only play in one particular space, i.e. LBOs or roll-ups. Others focus more on growth equity. In the case of Warburg Pincus, I think their bread and butter was growth equity. Over a number of decades, they had built some of the most successful technology companies in their growth equity investing within TMT, and they'd done it across a number of other industry sectors. Um, but they had a wide palette and aperture for the types of growth equity and roll-ups and buyouts that they could do. But the strength of their TMT and growth equity practice is what I was attracted to. Yeah, I usually think of PE as taking a majority ownership stake and control versus growth equity that doesn't necessarily take a, take that. Is that fair? Um, I'm also I, I, equally I, uninformed. <clears throat> uh, no, I, You're I, just I, 10 years behind <laughs> me. <laughs> um, I, I, think, uh, I think many PE firms do take a control position, um, but many also focus on growth equity and take minority positions. And uh, we've seen that with a number of firms. And so I think the model for private equity has changed where they're doing essentially late stage venture capital growth equity uh, in addition to LBOs and majority control investing. Great. But so if I'm, you know, if I uh, started as a startup and grew through my Series A, Series B, maybe C, I could be looking, Warburg could potentially be providing capital in my later rounds equally so to a later stage growth um, venture venture fund. Yes. Do you see founders that scale well um, from the startup phases to the growth phases, or do you see common mistakes or advice for founders? The founders that are really successful in the earliest stages tend to be very resourceful, uh, scrappy, and hack their way to, to an outcome. And the skills required to do that in an early stage are very different than at a later stage. And there are a few entrepreneurs who can cross that proverbial chasm, but it's it's rare. Early stage uh, entrepreneurs, when we describe them as resourceful, they're sort of uh, embracing the definition of entrepreneurship, which is you essentially have insufficient resources or fuel to get to your goal, but you still manage to get there. And that's kind of a, uh, a working definition, if you will, of, of entrepreneurship. Once a company's gotten from zero to one and it's beginning to scale the organization, the skills required have to do with managing people and inspiration and complex financial engineering large commercial relationships, managing risk, dealing with lawsuits and, uh, and uh, you know, legal chess plays and all sorts of other skills that early stage entrepreneurs oftentimes don't like to do, let alone have the skills um, to go uh, do comfortably, which is why they often set up um, people around them that are really smart to help grow them as entrepreneurs, um, either through a board of directors, through their advisors, through their own network and coaching. That kind of brings us to Comcast Ventures which I guess is in some ways part of Comcast, but in many ways it, it isn't. So maybe you could explain to me how Comcast Ventures operates. Uh, sure. So we operate as a venture capital fund with a single LP relationship with Comcast. Comcast is a very supportive partner in helping to work with our companies when there's an appropriate commercial relationship, channel partnership, or other, uh, other connection 
to a portfolio company. But first and foremost, um, we're fiduciaries with our portfolio companies, and we focus on delivering returns to our LP investor, Comcast, but we operate as an independent fund, and we're motivated by the carrying economic incentives of an independent fund. And I think from a differentiation standpoint, able to distinguish ourselves because we can help companies in ways both through Comcast as well as a program called Forecast Labs that we have, which can provide digital and TV marketing support for uh, portfolio companies at a cost basis and cost per acquisition that's very competitive in the marketplace that we haven't seen any other venture capital firm introduce. So it can severely advantage, for example, an e-commerce company that's doing direct-to-consumer acquisition. And we can do that because of our relationship with NBC Universal on the back end to have built this program. And of course, we don't charge anything for it. We generate our uh, returns based on investing in companies, uh, not running a cost structure to, to charge an allocation to portfolio companies. So because it wasn't totally clear to me before, when you say you're an independent fund, like what fund, do, do you number your funds? Um, we, we have, we do have vintage years. Yes. Uh, that we use internally. Uh, I don't think we disclose them externally. Um, uh, but we have uh, an investment committee that is our investment partnership. Those are our managing directors, uh, inside Comcast Ventures. And if you look at our processes, uh, for making investment decisions, our quarterly reporting to our LP and the way we work with our companies, if you were to talk to our CEOs, um, I think you'd see a lot of similarities to how any venture firm operates. The distinction is we're not driven by purely strategic need to satisfy the the growth opportunities for our LP. We're focused on delivering financial returns, um, but we have specific areas we, we look in, and um, the stage at which we invest also uh, shifts based on where our investment thesis lies. And what stage is that? Uh, so we're multi-stage investors. As I mentioned earlier, we invest from early seed stage, where we'll often lead a seed round all the way into growth, but our sweet spot is uh, effectively the equivalent of a Series A where we have product market fit. If you took a sector like uh, commerce marketplaces, in a marketplace, uh, especially a many-to-many marketplace, you have two constituents on uh, each side of the marketplace. And you have to win both over and at the same time create enough supply and demand to create liquidity in a marketplace. So doing those at the seed stage tends to be very high risk because it's almost like you have to win two customers and create liquidity between both customers. So I'd call that a much higher risk investment at an early stage, but once it reaches scale, it's very defensible because of the network effect. So we have specific investment theses, but um, the stage might affect uh, what uh, what entry point we come into a company with. And do you um, do you personally have particular areas of focus when you were saying all those investment theses? Are there some that are yours that you're uh, particularly excited about right now? Yes. Uh, we work as a team with respect to the sectors we focus on, but there are some areas that I spend the most time in. Um, I'd say one, one of those uh, investment areas is sustainability. Now, sustainability is a very broad topic, so it, it breaks down into a number of areas. It could be around food, um, clean energy and clean energy buying, transportation, obviously. So if we look at what's happened with transportation, we've essentially created a society where we have rapidly increasing congestion, pollution, uh, wasted time, GDP loss, um, modes of transportation that are unaffordable for uh, the general population, modes of transportation that don't fit um, the use cases within intracity or intercity travel. But when you talk about the mode doesn't match the need, I'm paraphrasing kind of roughly, do you mean that in terms of like our public transportation? Do you mean that in terms of just like shared mobility or what what are you thinking about there? Well, we need a we need an intelligent transportation network that works in conjunction with cities, municipalities, departments of transportation, in addition to private companies operating vehicles and, and transportation that make sense for different consumers. So we're investors in Bird. We do believe that there's a different mode of transportation and a and a short form transportation, typically under three to five miles that aren't as well suited for cars, especially for single passengers or sometimes for, for two passengers. It should be eco-friendly. Essentially, you know, all of the new um, modes of transportation are built on EV platforms. So there are other challenges with how our modes of transportation are evolving as a society. But the broader theme is w- we need better data sharing across private companies and better data sharing with municipalities and departments of transportation so we can inject a networked transportation environment. We need a a comfort with sharing data in controlled and safe environments where it's not releasing um, proprietary data to your competition, but releasing it to better 
um, the region that you're serving. Let me ask about corporate venture. Uh, it seems like there are more and more uh, corporate venture arms coming up every day. And I think you have said that you really don't think of Comcast Ventures so much as corporate venture. So a, a lot of companies have introduced um, affiliate venture capital arms, um, but they vary to a great degree. So I always encourage entrepreneurs to understand how their investor operates, what are their incentives, our confidentiality and our fiduciary responsibilities are first and foremost to those to the CEOs we work with and to the founding teams in those companies. And I think what you'll find is um, Comcast Ventures uh, pairs the best part of operations of an independent venture capital firm with a single LP. So we're not spending all our time fundraising. We're focused on um, building relationships with our portfolio companies and advancing the mission of those companies with um, some of the strategic advantages of a large technology and media conglomerate that can uh, serve as a channel partner and customer to some of those particular companies. Do you still have the Catalyst Fund? We do. And that's serving underrepresented founders? Correct. Great. And so that's still active and people could reach out. Do they reach out in the same way or is there a different, um, is someone else managing the Catalyst Fund? Yeah, uh, they can reach out to any partner at our fund or any other investor at our fund. In fact, we're looking at a Catalyst investment right now. Um, and we have a team that that focuses on that. Um, and uh, Catalyst is, is still very active. In fact, it's not just um, new investments that we're looking at. We're working with uh, new investment rounds with our existing portfolio companies. And uh, as of now, I'm actually helping one of those companies through a product pivot. And does the Catalyst Fund, uh, is it playing, is it writing the same size checks or is it more pre-seed and seed rounds? Uh, typically, it's more pre-seed and seed rounds. Yeah, we're very early with our um, investments in underrepresented um, founders and minorities. That's great. I just want to make sure people knew that that existed here in LA. Um, and, so and it exists nationally, in fact, globally. So we look at companies overseas as well as across the US for a catalyst. Great. Uh, I want to just ask a tiny bit about you before we wrap up. And just, uh, it seems like you've had an amazing career and you're in a great spot. Do you think, do you attribute that to some, you know, some piece of your personality, some piece of your childhood? My childhood probably played a pretty instrumental role in the things that motivate me and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, so if I roll the clock back, I grew up in a, the suburbs of Houston uh, from the age of four to 11. And growing up, I was uh, uh, a very curious kid and um, had an insatiable wonder with lots of things, particularly how things worked. And one of those areas I had directed a lot of that attention was how planes fly when I turned 16, I realized that I needed to uh, earn enough money to have a car because you have to drive typically when you're here, especially back in the 90s. And um, so I used to wash dishes for eight to 12 hours a day uh, on weekends to help pay for some of my expenses. And um, I even used to take flyers and put them on doors of houses and I'd canvas a neighborhood, uh, essentially the early days of guerrilla marketing. So if I take that curiosity that I had growing up and marry it with the work ethic. I applied as a chemical engineer to Northwestern, and uh, probably the two things you need to make sure you're successful in that program is uh, a really strong work ethic and a lot of curiosity. And fortunately, uh, those were sort of the themes in my childhood. And as a result of uh, those two themes in my childhood, I graduated as a chemical engineer in 1998, and along the way, <laughs> realized that it wasn't technology decisions that drove the commercialization of technology, and it certainly wasn't engineering decisions, it was business decisions. So when I graduated, I decided to um, focus where chemical engineers often focus, which is the energy and chemical sector, but do so as a business analyst. So I, did, I became a strategy analyst at a firm called Arthur D. Little, and then used that as a stepping stone to focus on strategy work, but in the technology industry. And that was my first entry point into real uh, technology as it's defined today, um, and started building companies from that point onward uh, over the course of my career. Hopefully the entrepreneurs get some value out of it, and uh, we create a vibrant ecosystem where everyone's helping each other. That's great. I love it. Um, glad to have you as part of the ecosystem. Yeah, Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming on the pod today. It was, it was wonderful having you. Thank you so much for having me.